Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to give everyone just another minute or two here. Kind of started up that webinar a little bit late. Give chance, give folks a chance to to join right quick before we get started. Okay, I will go. Let's go ahead and get started here. I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, this afternoon's webinar from the Region 7 Disaster Health Response Ecosystem. Uh, today's webinar titled, When Hot Is Not Just the Temperature Outside, Our Pre-Hospital Facility and Transfer Considerations. Um, Going through, we can see what our description is, talking about uh, various burn injuries, especially important over the summer months here and something that kind of kind of gets left on the wayside a little bit, unfortunately too much. Uh, we can see here our different objectives that we're looking to uh, to meet today through this webinar, um, common injuries, looking at roles and responsibilities, and then some of the evidence-based guidelines uh, for patient care. Uh, today's webinar is uh, does have continuing edu education credits available to you in just a little bit here. You'll see how we get how you claim those credits, um, but it is approved for uh, one credit for physicians, nurses, and our EMS partners. Uh, we do have, we are going to show our different disclosures that we have here. Here we have the disclosures for our two presenters, um, both for Dr. Webinwire, and uh, we've got one disclosure there for Dr. Lawler on our, our planning committee. During the webinar, uh, we do ask that anybody who has questions utilize the Q&A box uh, down at the bottom of your screen there rather than the chat. Um, we'll be monitoring both or anything like that, but we do prefer that you use that Q&A. It helps us with that um, and it lets us direct things towards our uh, presenters a little bit better there. 
to get to your continuing ed credits, you need to uh, log into your, you, the UNMC My CCE portal, and then you would use that activity code there down at the bottom of 57239 to uh, evaluate today's webinar and obtain your credits, your continuing education credits. Um, other than that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Judy Plasek here, uh, who will then introduce Dr. Webinmeyer, and we'll, we'll kind of go from there. So Judy has a master's degree in nursing and a post-master's certificate as a family nurse practitioner. Her background is in critical care, burn, and plastic surgery, with the last 23 years focused on the acute surgical and reconstructive care of the burn patient. She's a consultant to the ABA to help develop their disaster preparedness program as part of an ASPR grant. Judy's experience with disaster planning and exercise development helps to identify gaps in preparedness, provide technical assistance to healthcare facilities, and assist in continuing to build on the partnerships developed within the region. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Judy. Thank you, Thomas. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lucy Wibbenmeyer as our speaker today. Dr. Wibbenmeyer is a clinical professor and the director of the burn unit and program director of the burn fellowship at the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics. She was the 2020 president of the American Burn Association and the 2015 president of North American Burn Society. She has served almost a decade on the ABA board and has had prominent positions on many other ABA committees. She is an active clinical researcher and has authored over 70 peer reviewed peer-reviewed journal articles over the span of her career as both a surgeon and a leader. In her spare time, she enjoys swimming, biking, and spending time with her family and her dog. Uh, on a personal note, uh, I've been in and around burn care uh, for nearly 27 years at this point, and Dr. Wibbenmeyer and her team at the University of Iowa are a tremendous burn resource for our region. So many thanks to you, Dr. Wibbenmeyer, for sharing your time and your burn expertise and for providing this burn webinar for us this afternoon. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hello, good afternoon, Judy. Thank you very much for that introduction and thank you very much for inviting me to do this. I um, always enjoy talking to health professionals about burn care and trying to demystify it. Um, burn, fortunately, burn injuries, fortunately, don't happen that often, but because they don't happen that often, um, very few people outside burn centers see many of them. And so I think just having these lectures periodically sprinkled throughout the year really helps just keep keep um, burn care, um, you know, in front and center in your minds and not as scary when a burn patient comes into the ED or your facility. So um, as was stated, I have a few, con I have no conflicts. Um, I have a few disclosures. As stated, the objectives are threefold. Um, after this talk, I hope you'll be able to identify common etiologies for burn injuries. I'm hoping that you'll be able to discuss emergent burn care um, that can be done successfully to mitigate downstream complications. And then finally, that you'll know the evidence-based guidelines on when to communicate with the burn center or when to transfer your burn patients. In order to do all that, um, we'll first start off by talking about immediate treatment and concerns um, involving the burn patient. Hey, um, Dr. Wibbenmeyer, sorry, I'm going to need you to reshare your screen, screen again real quick there. We can't oh see your slides my. at the moment. Okay. Oh, must be over here. Is that working? We can see the slides, but they're not in presentation mode yet. Is that working? Yep. Perfect. Perfect. You didn't miss much. <laughs> um, so we'll start off and we'll talk about immediate needs. And then we'll go on to calculate burn size, burn depth, and resuscitation needs. Uh, and then we'll talk about a little bit about uh, when to worry about escharotomies. Um, when to talk to or consider transferring your burn patient. And finally, we'll, uh, we'll have a few words on burn mass casualty incidences. So many burns involve trauma. 
So immediately they should be treated like trauma patients. That means you go through your primary survey, A, B, C, D, and E. There are a few caveats that are special for burn patients. If, we start with A, so if they are in respiratory distress or cannot protect their airways, they need to be intubated. Same as a trauma patient. Short of that, you proceed down the line. Um, you wanna check your blood pressure and your pulse. Um, importantly with burn patients, if they have burned extremities, you're gonna to wanna to make sure they have pulses in all extremities. You're gonna do a quick neuro exam and then you're gonna expose the patient. Uh, not unlike trauma patients, you, you wanna look for any injuries you may have missed. In, in the case of a burn patient, you're looking for burn injuries in particular. The one thing that's important, especially during the winter time when you're doing this for your burn patients is to keep them warm. They can drop their blood pressure or they can drop their body temperature pretty fast. And especially with the volumes you have to give them if you're dealing with a large burn patient, it's hard to keep up. So we always, in the ED, we always have the room warmed or we have a bear hug around them or, and or both. Um, so let's start with A, and this is where a burn patient may differ from a trauma patient. After you've done your primary survey, you're gonna to wanna to collect a full history. And in that history, you're gonna to wanna to know how they got burnt, right? Um, and when you're talking about an airway, you wanna know in particular, was this an injury that happened in an enclosed space? Was it a house fire? Or was it simply one of the fires we often see in Iowa pouring gas on brush or grass, and it was a flashback? Um, if the one um, thing you can almost, 99.9% .9 place your bet on that if it did not happen in an enclosed space, you are not going to have an airway injury. And so short of that, you have time. If you're unsure, you can always communicate with your burn center and say, hey, this is what I'm looking at. What do you think? Do you think there might be an airway injury? Certainly on the sending end, you guys are in charge of treating the immediate needs of the burn patient, but we're here to help you. So the, the, the one thing that goes with an inhalation injury, again, is, uh, is a fire that happens within an enclosed space. Otherwise, there's several signs and symptoms that people have been trying for years to relate to inhalation injury. And they're really neither sensitive or, they're spe or specific. Certainly, if someone has carbonaceous sputum, and especially if they're expectorating the sputum, they've had some sort of an inhalation injury, but that doesn't tell you if they need to be intubated. If they're looking fine and they don't have respiratory distress, they don't usually need to be intubated right away. The other thing that, um, that strongly suggests an inhalation injury is if they were unconscious at the scene. So depending how that patient is doing, they may be someone who needs to be watched closely, maybe intubated before transfer. Those two signs are the most sensitive. But again, nothing has really stuck as as standing out and relating to, yep, they have an inhalation injury, or yep, they're gonna to need to be intubated because they're gonna get into trouble. It's kind of the constellation of what you're looking at. The other thing I would say in the symptoms is strider. Anyone who has strider, I don't care if they're a burn patient or a trauma patient or a post-surgical patient, that's someone who has some swelling and will get into trouble. So that's kind of um, something that, that would, uh, if a patient had strider, they would have to be intubated before transfer. So um, the diagnosis of inhalation injury, this patient, especially if they're coughing up carbonaceous sputum, they probably had an inhalation injury, but that doesn't necessarily mean they need to be intubated uh, before transfer. Again, that takes um, you know, eyes on the patient and, um, and then also a good history. So there's three different types of inhalation injury that you may deal with. The first one is toxic gas exposure. The second is actually a burn to the upper airway. And the third is a burn to the lower airway. So the first air inhalation injury type is asphyxiation from toxic gases. And this is actually more common than burn injury. The two gases we're talking about here are carbon monoxide and hyd hydrogen cyanide. Both of these arrest metabolism and they cause uh, anaerobic metabol they, they cause the body to shift into anaerobic metal metabolism. And you'll see that because the lactic acid will go up. But usually in reality, we're not waiting for a lactic acid to come up. If we have a burn patient that got burned in an enclosed space, they're gonna be put on oxygen. 
because oxygen will displace the carbon monoxide from the hemoglobin molecule and get rid of it. Um, and, and actually that's all you need to do for carbon monoxide. And carbon monoxide actually is very easy to, to measure. You just send a blood gas off and you're looking for carbon um, carboxyhemoglobin. And levels above 10 usually indicate that that patient had significant exposure. The second gas that we worry about is hydrogen cyanide. That actually is very difficult to measure. So usually if we are suspicious of an inhalation injury or the burn happened in, in an enclosed space, we'll just go ahead and treat. To treat for hydrogen cyanide, you can't displace it, you need to metabolize it. And the way we do that is we administer vitamin B12. And that comes in the form of the cyano kit. I am not aware of any other formulation for vitamin B12 in the US. So that's why this little cyano kit is there. That came out maybe five years ago and it made treatment for hydrogen cyanide toxicity much easier. So again, if we're suspecting an inhalation injury, we go ahead and put people on oxygen and we go ahead and we give them vitamin B12. Now, be aware that when you give vitamin B12 in the cyano kit preparation, everything is gonna turn red. The urine will turn red, the skin will get a reddish hue. Um, and this doesn't just last for eight hours or 12 hours, it can last a couple of days. So just be prepared for that. The second airway injury that you could deal with is an upper airway injury. And this is the one everyone fears. A house fire has a temperature of about 100, in, 100 degrees Fahrenheit at, at your ankle level. At your eye level, assuming you're standing straight up, it's about 600. So you can imagine it can melt clothes at that temperature and it can certainly burn your upper airway, the airway above the cords. Um, and what will happen is, is that airway will swell up. So this is the airway injury that can get you in trouble that everyone worries about. Should I intubate the patient? Presuming you're transferring them. Should I intubate them before I transfer or will they do okay? Um, we used to, we did a lot of teaching where if, if you thought there was an inhalation injury, put a tube in. And the result has been, everyone's listened. <laughs> and we've had um, a lot of people come intubated and then we extubate them um, sometimes immediately or sometimes the next day. And there's been some trauma associated with that as you can imagine. So now the teaching is, if you have a severe face or neck burn, severe, and if they can't protect their airway, and then certainly if they're in respiratory distress, then intubate. It's still better to in err on intubating than having a patient have a problem, especially like in a small helicopter, um, which is virtually impossible to intubate them. So again, it's a judgment call and we're all making judgment calls, but hopefully those three little factors will help you. And the fact that they got burned in an enclosed space. The third type of airway injury that you could come into contact with is a lower inhalation injury. And that is secondary to particulate absorption in the airway. So a marker of that is soot. So when we, when we do bronchoscopy, that's the way we can detect this, we see soot and you can see that in the middle photo. Soot is not toxic, it's carbon, but what's absorbed on the soot can be toxic. So whatever particles you get down in your airway, and it actually is a chemical burn to the airway. And you can see the lower picture on hospital day 10 uh, shows a really friable injury, just very much like you might have on the skin. So it's a cutaneous chemical burn to the airway. Now, this is the one that, again, it doesn't happen immediately. It happens hours, hours, like the next day, you can have people maybe go into some respiratory issues or, um, or they develop ARDS um, or prolonged need for the ventilator. Um, so inhalation injuries, a tumor inhalation injury, people are intubated for like three weeks. So those are your three types of airway injuries. So the most pressing are the toxic gas, and then the second one would be the upper airway. So let's move on to resuscitation. So the first thing, and pretty quickly, you're going to want to be able to calculate the size and the depth of your burn injury. Burns lose a lot of fluid, and they do this pretty rapidly. They, they lose it through their skin, and they lose it into their third space. And then all other compartments, the orbital compartment, the lungs, the abdomen, and the extremities. Um, there's three ways to calculate burn size, going from the simplest to the more complex. The simplest method is the palm method. 
various people will say different things. I say the palm, and it's not your palm, it's the patient's palm, is 1% of their body surface area. So if you have, this works best for a scatter burn, so you can like palm it out and you can estimate their percent that way. Um, if it's a bigger burn, you're gonna wanna use something like rule of nines or Lund Browder. So the rule of nines, there's actually an infant one, but all you really have to do remember is adult and child. So the adult body works really nicely. The, if you burn your whole head, it's 9%. If you burn your face, it'd be 4.5. A whole arm is nine. A whole leg is 18. The front and back is 18 and 18. For a kid, the difference is their head is twice as big. So their head is 18% and their legs are smaller. Each leg is 14% a piece. And we usually say kids in the burn world as less than 30 kilos. And then when they get to the burn center, we estimate it using a Lund Browder. And again, the easiest way to do this is like if I have an upper arm burn, I'll say, oh, about 50% is burned. The upper arm, the whole upper arm is 4%. So that would be 2% burn. And then you just add up all the parts. When people get older than 15, we use um, the adult measurements. So again, that's when that's a little bit more specific when they're in the center. Um, I often will do what, what we do at, at our university is we, since it's so subjective as you can imagine, um, we have two calculators. We have one one person from the nurse team, one person from the physician team, and we each calculate, and then we fight about it. <laughs> then we we compare and we say, okay, well, I think yeah, I give or take a little bit, and then we come up with our average. And so that's how we do it and get pretty close. Um, so the important thing next before, because you need to have this information to calculate resuscitation is you want to be able to tell what depth you're looking at. So burn wounds can come in four different depths. First degree is sunburn, limited just to the epidermis. These hurt a lot and every now and then we'll see them, but they're of not much consequence except for a lot of pain. Um, second degree extends into the dermis. Um, those are also called partial thickness. So you'll hear that a lot too. Third degree extends all the way to the fat. And fourth degree extends to bone, cartilage, muscle, fascia. Um, those are typically going to be nose, ears, anterior tibial area, Achilles. Um, and they're more common with certain types of uh, injuries, like electrical injuries, contact injuries, crush injuries. Oh, my little arrows. I did this this morning. I'm sorry. <laughs> I should have been doing this. Epidermis, dermis, fat, and then muscle. Uh, so now I'm going to show you some pictures because I think a burn talk without pictures is uh, incomplete. Um, so pathognomonic for partial thickness or second degree burn wounds into the dermis are blisters. These wounds are usually moist and they're pink. As you can see from the upper picture, that's what typically we'll see on presentation. We'll see a blister and we'll see fragile skin next to it. So sometimes when I get a call and they're trying to tell me what size it is, um, I'll ask them, well, when you put your fingers on the skin next to the blisters, does it slough? And if it sloughs, of course, the wound's gonna be bigger. So, um, and you can see from these two pictures, uh, the bottom one is the clean wound that we immediately, when we take, when we when we get a patient, we take them to the tub room, or if they're not going to be admitted, we take them to the clinic if they're smaller, and we clean them up, and we take all those blisters off, and so you can see his nice clean wound down below, and um, and this would blanch if you put pressure on it, and that's very important because um, because that means that they have blood supply. So pathognomonic for partial thickness wounds are they have blood supply and they'll blanch with pressure, they're moist, and they're extremely painful. And the blanching is important because it means they have intact uh, vasculature that will heal these wounds. So in the burn world, we um, see a fair amount of abuse and neglect. So these are partial thickness wounds, um, but what you see on the left side is a child who was dunked. What you see is you see, um, you, they were dunked like in water, say, hot water. So what you see is you see uniform burn wounds with cutoff lines. Um, and that these cutoff lines are pathognomonic for a dunking injury. You also can 
see a glove injury too that's similar a, a, a hand is held underwater as opposed to say hot water was turned on then you may have a flow and the, and the kid reached and then you may have you'll have a flow pattern where you'll have a burn that goes down say the chest or goes down the arm or goes down the leg these are cutoffs it's really hard to create cutoffs in in nature and then this is an industrial scald accident from work both of these full healing we also see a lot of childhood injuries because the kids are curious. And so they'll reach up and they'll pull things down. So faces are usually very vascular and they heal very nicely. Um, here's a good example of, again, a second degree burn from a flash injury in this, this case. Blanche with pressure, here's day zero, fully healed by day 11. You'll see the pigment is starting to come back. If it's deeper, sometimes the pigment doesn't come back. And this is something we talk about. And then here he is at three months and he's fully repigmented. Sometimes we get a little hyperpigmented. Now we'll move on to full thickness injuries. These injuries actually involve the epidermis, the dermis, all the way into the subcutaneous tissue. Um, they typically, they can appear any color really. They can be gray, they can be white, they can be red. Um, they usually are covered by a thick eschar. You can see this more prominently in the lower extremities here. Um, the upper extremity is not a picture from admission. It's a picture a couple of days after admission. So what you see is you see an eschar, but we also have a pseudo eschar where it's a buildup of dead tissue and sylvanine. Um, usually you'll have a step off in the tissue because you'll actually have a, a, a defect as that burn goes all the way into the fat. We'll get back to these legs in a few slides. These wounds do not heal. If they're small, they have a chance from healing from the edge, but if they're of any size, they all need to be grafted. So again, on presentation, they can be any color. You can see this is full thickness. It doesn't blanch on pressure. It's dry, it's not moist. Um, you might see the little punctate hemorrhages where the blood vessels are seared. Um, and th this is, Sometimes in burn, you have to try to figure out how these injuries happen too. And this was a young lady who lived in a, a group home um, and she decided to take a bath and the water was too hot. So you can see on her bottom, that area that's not burned is where she was sitting on the tub and then her leg was bent. And that's more of a flow type pattern where the water hit her leg and flowed down to her foot. And here's more. This was a gentleman who was making uh, methamphetamine back in the early 2000s in his trailer. And you can see that he has a deep face burn and deep hand burns. And actually, if you look at this hand, um, his fingernails are all sloughed and they're down here with the rest of his skin. That's a fourth degree burn. Um, that's a burn where when you burn your fingernails off, you're usually going to lose the tip of those fingers. Sometimes it involves the extensor um, mechanism as well. His face went on to heal, and we'll get to chemical burns in just a few slides, but um, presumably that was an acid burn, and acid does not burn like alkalis. And here's more pictures of full thickness, and this is so different from a scald injury. As you can see, this is um, the, the tissue that's seared on edge there, and then you can see how it's white, and then you can see as you progress up towards his belly button, um, it's more pink and it's a variable depth. Um, maybe it's deep partial, maybe it's maybe it's just even first degree. And then here's some more. This gentleman was a driver in a car who was trapped. Um, you have to be trapped to get such a severe injury like this. So this is just full thickness involving his bottom, full thickness involving his legs and his feet. He um, unfortunately needed um, transmetatarsal amputations, but but did quite well. And sometimes it's hard when we have uh, people of color because they um, their skin looks a little bit different. Um, sometimes it's a little bit harder to judge. Sometimes it's a little, I'll tell you, it's a little bit harder to see cellulitis for one. Um, but this is what you would do if you had a, pa when you get, when we get patients that are admitted, we're trying to judge depth. We tell the patient, I'm gonna push on your wound and we see if it blanches. So that's, we're checking for um, blanching there. So we're checking the depth of the injury. And then, and then you can just see that he, he has some deeper areas around his ear, especially, and around his eye, where those are gonna be full. And maybe towards his um, medial face, that may heal. And then finally, the last picture um, is of 
a pediatric can. Again, children examine and they're curious with their hands. Palm burns are especially difficult to treat and we let them kind of, we let them kind of um, declare themselves before we operate. But unfortunately, when they look this deep, this is a full thickness and this will need an operation. So just very quickly, I'm gonna to touch on zones of injury. Sometimes burns look superficial at first, but sometimes they deepen. So where the burn wound that you look at on admission is called the zone of coagulation. That's the area that's not gonna recover. But depending on if the burn gets infected, doesn't get treated right away, so there's some delay, gets too much resuscitation, gets too little resuscitation, whatever else happens, that area of coagulation can get bigger and it can convert a layer, which we call a zonostasis, into coagulation and your, your wound can deepen. Um, and so this is what can happen. So the picture on the left is from a little boy who got tangled up with his mom when they were making macaroni and he had hot water spilled on him. And you can see a little bit of area that looks deeper along his chin area, on his shoulder, and then the other picture on the right is him four days later, how fast burn wounds can uh, progress. And some of that is pseudo-escar from sylvidine, but most of that is just um, escar full, from a full thickness injury, from an injury that just converted. Scalds are notorious for doing that. So he needed all that operating operated on. So why do we talk about burn depth? We talk about burn depth because only second and third degree should be counted towards resuscitation. And only second and third degree that add up to more than 20% should be resuscitated. A lot is written about how to resuscitate burn patients. I think um, the only two formulas I probably have you remember is Parkland and Brooke. And actually, we if you would call the University of Iowa, want to transfer a patient, if it's a kid or an adult, we just always say Parkland um because we make it easier for transfer and so what i mean by that um so uh, people uh burn patients are resuscitated by body weight burn formulas and so you actually take the percent if, you, if the patient's 25 percent, you just take 25 you multiply it by their body weight in kilos say they're 70 kilos 25 times 70 and then you multiply it by a factor parkland uses four brooke uses two or three so in transfer, we just say to Parkland. Um, and in reality, you need to give kids a little bit more, but our transfers don't take, you know, usually don't take that long. So let's give you a sample calculation. So you have a 53 year old male with a 40% burn, he weighs 70 kilos. So you wanna do 70 is weight, 40 is percent times four. That would give you 11, little over 11 liters in 24 hours. So that's only an estimate, right? So we divide that by two because, and we give, we give that in eight hours because the capillary leak, the amount of fluid you need to give mysteriously decreases at eight hours. <laughs> not, not totally true, but um, that's, our, that's our ballpark. And then you take that number, divide by eight. So some people say you take the 70, 40 times four, 11 liters, divide by 16. That's divide by two, divide by eight. And that's what you start with. So we start with 700 and then we just titrate it. We have a nice little titration up up 10%, up by 70, 10% of that 700 or down by 70 if they make their urine output goals or if they don't. That's that's all you do. And I'm gonna make it easier in, in, in a minute. And so what that means is that that's how much fluid they could get in 24 hours. But again, we use their urine output as a goal. For kids, the caution with kids is their body surface area is bigger than an adult in uh, body surface compared to their weight. And so they require more fluid. They require resuscitation and maintenance. And for kids less than one, you gotta watch their glucose. So we give them D5 as maintenance. And so for a kid, you do the same thing. It's just like Parkland but you use three and kids are less than 30 kilos. So again, weight, total body surface area burned times three and then divide by 16 and that gives you your starting rate. But you add maintenance. 
and we use the 421 rule. And we give that as D5LR. And I didn't tell you, but you want to use LR. And I think most of you are familiar with that. You want to use LR as your resuscitation fluid. So in reality, this is what happens. We start the patient off, say it's 700 an hour. We go up because they're not making their urine. We go down because they made it. We go up because they didn't make it. And then slowly we get down to maintenance, but it's quite the process. Now, I told you I'd make it easier. So if you're dealing, if you do your burn calculations and you have over 30% burn, this works best for the field. Um, if you're less than five years old, start them at 125. If you're between six and 13, start them at 250. And if you're over 14 years old, start them at 500. And then once they get to the hospital, or if you're uncomfortable with calculating, you can always use these, 125, 250, 500. So the next immediate problem that can, can, doesn't often, but can happen, would be the need to decompress by decompress the burn wound by doing um, escarotomies, which are incisions through the tight escar. This doesn't usually happen acutely unless you are dealing with a severe, severe burn. The picture below is a severe, severe burn. This is how he came to us. He was actually, the, the um, escar was already contracting. What happens is you have this firm, unyielding escar. It's like a leather jacket um, and it's unyielding. And then you have healthy tissue underneath it, which is absorbing all this fluid. And so you can imagine that tissue is going to swell. And so what you've got to do is you've got to release the pressure by making your incisions. So unless you're dealing with a burn like this, or unless you are maybe delayed, the patient doesn't come right away, or you've got some transport issues, you often are not going to need to perform escarotomies. But I will show you how, just in case. Uh, one thing you're going to want to do, though, is perform pulse checks hourly. Um, and in, if, if we lose our pulses, that's an indication for us to do escarotomies. Sometimes we'll do them prophylactically. Sometimes we'll wait for a pulse loss. So in case you need to do them, this is how you would perform them. Um, you want to make your incisions on the lateral and medial axillary lines. You want to avoid any kind of um, joints going across joints or going near any, any close to any of the nerves that, um, that course more closely to the um, surface, like your ulnar nerve. Um, and then you wanna do it with electrocautery. We go from unburned to unburned. Um, we incise into the fat. It's, it's one of the best feelings to actually see the tissue expand once you release it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you have to give lots of pain meds. Ketamine is a wonderful drug to do these under. Um, and so we frequently really use ketamine. Sometimes you have to release the chest to help them ventilate. Sometimes you have to release the neck. I haven't done many of those, but that, that sometimes has to be done as well. Um, sometimes you have to release the back of the hands. I, I try not to, some people show you releasing a palm. I try not to release the palm because anywhere you make your incisions, they're gonna be, you're going to be able to see those. Those are going to usually be deeper than your grafting. I mean, if you have to do them, you have to do them, but just be aware that, so like if you have a palm, if you release a palm and there's not a graft on there, you've just created an open wound for that patient. Um, and sometimes you have to release fingers too. So if you have to do them, that's how you do them. You can use a, a knife as well. It, you just might get into more bleeding. And so if we have an, we usually admit our patients to the burn unit, but if we have to go through the ED because it's a trauma too, uh, we'll haul our electrocardiogram machines down to the ED. So now the next uh, item that you'll get to when you're evaluating your patients is um, the need to either talk to a burn center or uh, for consultation, or maybe you've decided that your hospital can't, uh, isn't equipped to handle the burn and you need to transfer. So I want to say that every single burn center out there is more than willing to talk about burn patients. We're just sitting there ready. <laughs> so never worry about calling. Um, and I think this is why this was recently revised, because um, many times um, 
a patient doesn't need to be transferred in the middle of the night. Many of our kids especially um, have very small wounds that we can all do during waking hours. And, um, and there is um, a little overuse of, of ambulances and helicopters that, that we could rein in a bit. And I think uh, using um, our telecommunications would really help uh, on both ends. Um, so the reasons for immediate consultation and considerations for transfer would be partial thickness or secondary burns greater than 10%, any full thickness burn, burns to any functional areas like hands, face, feet, joints, um, and anyone who has comorbidities or concomitant trauma that could make burn care difficult. And another one that's been recently added was poor pain control. Um, Everyone can provide pain control. Um, I think people who work with burns um, are really used to the high opioids that these patients need. And so, um, and it's, and I know everyone else has multidisciplinary teams, but uh, I'm very proud of our multidisciplinary work that we do. And so, um, so we're more than happy to take patients who also have poorly controlled pain. Anyone who has an inhalation injury, um, all pediatric burns can benefit from the burn center. Uh, chemical burns and electrical, high, high voltage electrical burn patients should be considered for immediate consultation and transfer. Now, burns less than 10%. It just depends. Um, they don't, they might not need to come right away. Um, we get a lot of calls and we'll say um, the clinic will call you the next day to schedule an appointment. So um, we have, I, we tried to get tele, uh, telemedicine set up with our burn unit. It's a long and sorted history. So we've gone to having them have the patient take a photo of their wounds and we upload that to our email and um, it's helped. And so we can actually see the email, we can see the picture, we can do just-in-time education. And I think it's really helped us uh, facilitate um, seeing the patient in a timely manner. Um, because truly some hospitals in Iowa will see one burn patient a year and that's it. And so it's hard to keep up on those skills. Um, we will also consider, we'll consult on anyone you want to, um, you, you suspect have an inhalation injury. And then finally, low voltage electrical injuries. They might, they might not need to be seen right away, but certainly they have as many problems long-term as high voltage uh, can. And so um, they should at least be given one follow-up appointment with the burn center. So I hope all that's clear. I don't know what time it is. Am I good on time? E. Okay, um, I, I think we're okay. Um, so now we're gonna change gears and we're gonna talk about uh, different etiologies. Scald, contact, and flame injuries are by far the most common injury you're gonna see. But there are just two others we'll just briefly talk about. The first one is chemical burns. Um, they cause about 10% of the burn injuries you'll see. So they're not that frequent. Um, certainly, if you have dry chemicals, you brush them off. Almost every chemical can be irrigated off with water. We will pH the burned area. We'll pH the skin, we'll pH our irrigation, um, just to make sure we have enough double checks and uh, we'll see if it's alkali or acid. Um, oftentimes, if people are injured at work, they'll be able to bring in their MSDS sheet and you'll know the offending agent and the concentration. But again, water, 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 and water as soon as you can get it. Um, a lot of people luckily will have um, doused themselves before they come into our burn unit. Again, chemical burns are some of the most painful burns that I have seen. And then of course, decon if it's a large area and, um, and decontamination is recommended. The, the problematic, uh, burn here is alkali. And most of our chemical injuries are from uh, alkalotic agents. Um, the problem with these agents is they liquefy tissue and they go deep. And it's, they can cause tremendous damage and they can cause a lot of um, irritation and long lasting damage to eyes. So if we get a call about a chemical burn, we usually have them irrigate, start the irrigation in the ED, continue it in the ambulance. And we certainly, if it involves the eye, we put this little Morgan lens that you can see in the picture above in the eye and continue irrigation until they see us in clinic. Um, very different than acid burns. Acid burns are not as caustic as alkali burns. 
Now I do want to talk about one burn that you may see. Um, it's not that common. Um, we might see a couple a year. I haven't seen one in a while now. And that's a hydrofluoric acid burn. This is uh, more common in um, dry cleaners, rust removers, glass etchers. Those are the type of, of injuries I have seen. Um, it is an extremely painful burn wound. You may not even see a burn, but the patient will be in excruciating pain. It's also involved in computer manufacture. So those places that use hydrofluoric acid, they have calcium gluconate gel that patients will put on immediately. Because if you spill it on your hand, uh, you have to bind the fluoride with calcium. If you don't do that immediately, it's gonna get absorbed. And when it gets absorbed, then you have to inject uh, calcium gluconate. And so first it's topical. And we used to say crush Tums. Crush it, mix it with uh, KY, and it's usually, a, it's usually a hand burn and put it in a glove. Or if it's an arm, you smear it on the arm. Again, got to do it immediately. Otherwise, you have to inject. If it involves a large area, we will have interventional place interarterial catheters and infuse calcium gluconate. And certainly, um, you can do the same thing with the solution in the eye. So another type of injury that you'll see is electrical burns. These constitute about 5% of the burn injuries you may see. So again, not that common. But I, I, I dread electrical injuries because you never really know what you're getting. And the ones that are most problematic are the high voltage. So we divide electrical injuries by uh, less than 1,000 or greater than 1,000. I always wondered, why is it 1,000? It's 1,000 because that's the voltage at, at which it will arc. And you can see this gentleman was... was um, was a lineman and was working near electrical wire and reached out and grabbed it. And you can see where it the, the current traveled up his body and went out his arm right before his armpit and then transitioned into his body again, so arced. And you can see where it burnt the skin, where it went out and where it went in. So the electrical current, what it does is it travels through the body, through the tissues. And as it travels, tissues with more resistance are gonna heat up. So the problem with this current flow is that it can tend to heat up muscle and bone. And so of course that's central in your limbs and that will heat up. And as that heats up, it swells and it can give you a compartment syndrome. And that's what I mean by tip of the iceberg. Before we get to that, uh, the other problem we see with electrical injuries is we see cardiac dysrhythmias. If the, if the electrical, um, if the electricity crosses the heart, sometimes you can, you can go into arrest. These patients are easily resuscitated though. We've had so many patients go into arrest and they get resuscitation, they get shocked and they, and they come back right away. Um, but you can have all sorts of arrhythmias and so they need to be monitored. And then associated trauma. Sometimes the electrical burn is so bad that you, that you don't realize that, that you broke your arm. We've had that happen. So, so patients can get thrown back by the electricity too. So they really, truly um, need their ABCDs and Es. And then they need their tertiary survey the next day. So this is a picture of that gentleman's arm. And this kind of looked like his other arm because remember he grabbed the wire. So his forearm, I don't know if my pointer works, but his forearm, this was intact skin. This is he developed a compartment syndrome. So he needed a, a carpal tunnel release and then a forearm release. And so that's the amount of swelling he had. So this, it's very difficult in electrical injuries to uh, detect compartment syndrome. You either have to have a good feel for, yep, this is compartment syndrome, or you have to measure it because people come in in such pain and they're usually in tetany, their, their hands usually flexed. And so you're not doing no two point discrimination on them, the usual test that you might do to assess if they have a compartment syndrome because it's just, they're just too painful and they can't move their fingers. Um, if the compartment syndrome is not recognized right away, um, sometimes the muscle will die. And in that case, um, you can spill myoglobin into your urine and you develop rhabdomyolysis and renal failure. And this is a good example of that. You can see these tubes that are collected. We used to do this and we kind of got away from it. Um, the red is, the urine is kind of tea colored at first. You treat this by increasing the fluids at first. That's our go-to. We want to increase the fluids. We want to flush this out. 
if the patient is stable and we're not making progress that way, then we talk about giving mannitol. But this, if we leave the urine like, like the T color, that's gonna, they're gonna end up in renal failure. So electrical injury patients are, um, can be difficult, okay? So we've gotten to the last um, part of the talk and that's uh, burn mass casualty incidences. Um, and so I'm gonna spend the next couple of slides talking about this. Um, a burn center, um, when they're overwhelmed, when they're beyond their capability um, to care for patients, uh, they need to reach out to regional centers. <clears throat> and we are, um, we're developing the ABA plan, but we have, um, but the regional center plan, which Judy has a lot to do with and, and all you guys as well. And so I don't know why I'm giving this talk, <laughs> but I'll just give you a couple slides. Um, the regional plans are pretty solid. So um, in a burn mass casualty uh, incident, you're gonna have to make some hard decisions, right? We're all gonna have to make hard decisions. And so this is a grid that's been developed of, of survival expectations. Don't get confused by these colors because they're different than the tags you would put on people. So I hesitate to color them this way. I might change it in the future, but you can see the gray here are the people who are expected not to live. Um, the red, those patients will have very low survival. And so let me orient you. So the, um, the vertical axis is age and the horizontal axis is burn size. So if you go all the way to the left side, you'll see the patients that could be treated as outpatients. And that's of course important, right? Because if we're in the middle of a burn MCI, we're gonna run out of space fast. And so anyone we can get as an outpatient is gonna be ideal. So one thing we've talked about at our center is we've talked about how to, how to guide uh, EMS, if we're in the middle of a burn MCI. And uh, one of the things we've come up with is if a patient's over 90% um, total body surface area burned, that's their first triage. If they're over 90%, 90, 90 then they're going to be triaged to a, a regional non-burn center hospital. If they're not, then their second triage would be, are they intubated? If they're intubated and greater than 20%, and we're, we're dealing with a mass casualty, they go to the burn center. If they're intubated in less than 20%, they go to another hospital who can provide care transitionally. If they're not intubated and they're over 30%, they go to our burn center. If they're not intubated and they're less than 30% and we're really in the middle of a mass casualty, they will be triaged to another hospital. It's, it's really hard for me to say this because I would want every burn patient in Iowa. Um, so if our burn center is overwhelmed or any burn center in our Midwest area, uh, the first reach out, and I have this information in the next slide, will be to regions or to Judy as a Nebraska coordinator. Um, the regions have been divided by trauma. ASPR has region seven, as you can see there in the upper right. Um, the ABA has divided them to the regions in the lower right, Midwest, Southern, Northeast, Western, Great Lakes. And then I show our region, our ABA uh, designated Midwest region. So this would be, so if the call went in for a burn mass casualty in the Midwest, these would be all the burn centers that would be contacted for a bed count. So if you go on the ABA website, um, you can look under each of these uh, regions and you'll have a similar plan uh, that's been drawn up. And then you see um, who to contact right there. So it's Mark Johnson or Judy, PlaySec. Um, and these are for every region we have. Coming soon is gonna be a number, a centralized number at the ABA that will also be available to be called to help in this. So um, that's still being worked through. So stay tuned. I do wanna put a call out though, that if you go on the ABA website, you go under quality, you go under disaster, there is some just-in-time training that you could also uh, look at to help with your burn center or your non-burn center hospital planning. Another thing we've come up with at our hospital is an internal triage. So this is, it's still a work in progress, um, but this is, 
potentially, again, by age vertically, burn size horizontally, where patients could land in the case of a burn mass casualty. The red is our burn center. The, the pink is our pediatric ICU. The green is our clinic uh, for discharge, presumably. The blue is the floor. So this is something that um, could potentially help your center. The other thing we've done is we have two carts uh, that are fully loaded and then periodically the material is cycled through before it expires. Those carts will treat one large, so one 20% or more burn patient or two small burn patients. We also have a list of what these carts include. And um, so we can, if we have a burn mass casualty, we can say um, the, the ICU can pull up the list and then they can gather all the materials they need to do a dressing change. So I think that might be a helpful thing to, to have. And I'm, I'm willing to share anything that anyone would want uh, to have at their disposal as well. So what you will be asked to do in a disaster. You may be asked to provide initial care for 72 hours. Certainly burn centers are asked that, but in a very large mass casualty, non-burn centers may have to do this. So CARES during that time, we didn't talk about all these, but um, this is where just-in-time training comes in. Um, we, you're, you'll be expected to be able to res resuscitate. And after this talk, you, you can, um, and provide emergent care. Um, you'll be maybe having to do ventilation and airway injury management. Nutrition is something that's important for anyone greater than 20%. Physical, occupational therapy, wound care, pain control, and counseling. And then within 72 hours, uh, the goal is to have patients transferred to a burn center and usually a verified burn center, but a burn center will do in a mass casualty incident. So what's important is um, just-in-time training and, and more important is to have that available at your fingertips. Um, and again, I wanted to point you to the ABA website is just one place you can get that just-in-time training. And then, of course, practice, 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 practice is important. And I think that's the end. Oh, my gosh. I only saved four minutes for questions. That's so great. Thank you so much, Dr. Obermeyer. That was great. Um, are there any questions um, from anyone you could certainly place them in the Q&A, or if you would like to unmute, you can certainly ask your question uh, live as well. One thing I wanted to um, mention was that a lot of these resources are available in the um, coalition burn annexes that were recently developed as well as um, I've recently revised and added a lot of resources to the state burn annex, which will be uh, generated broadly here um, in the uh, next few days or so. The other um, effort that we're working on as well is regionalizing the resources. So what we have, for example, in Nebraska, I've reached out um, to Dr. Wibbenmeyer's team and we've shared uh, annexes and resources and had conversations so what we're trying to do is not um, be redundant um, in our efforts, but make sure that the resources are spread widely and that people do have the information that they, that they need should they need to take care of a number of burn patients. Because as Dr. Wibbenmeyer said, people just don't take care of burn patients very, um, very commonly, and particularly our pre-hospital people that would be inundated with them uh, should there be you know, a, a surge of patients. The other thing I wanted to touch on real quickly, let me see. Um, let, me, let me get to the question first. Do you have information or annexes for chemical related MCIs? So yeah, so the Region 7 Disaster Grant does have some resources out on our website, so I will post those. We also are finalizing up some chemical um, some chemical guidelines for different medications um, for that as well that will get posted on our website within about the next two weeks. And then next year, we will be pushing on a lot of chemical education as that's kind of the health the HPP requirement for next year. So Judy or Dr. Wibbenmeyer, do you have any other chemical related information or annexes? I don't. We, um, 
I have a chemical uh, cutaneous injury and patient management resource on our Region 7 website um, that I'm happy to share. And then one other thing, um, since Dr. Obermeyer mentioned supplies, it always comes up when we're talking about exercises and, and uh, management during a surge of patients, is Asper created a tool. And um, there are four modules in that tool, and it's www.tool dot org um, and burn is one of the modules and what it does is it's um, one of the first tools that's been developed that actually is more of a live uh, inventory if you will so you would enter in uh, demographics for your facility and for your um, community you would enter in what you have um, on your inventory and it would calculate what you are predicted to need based on the demographics that you input so it's another tool that we use in preparedness, not during response, but it's a great tool um, to add to your uh, preparedness efforts. Can you put those links in the chat? Yes. Possible. And then Judy, it looks like there's one question that just hopped up for you guys. So any suggestions on best pain meds and route if an IV is difficult? Hmm. Well, um, so IV is what we re recommend, right? Um, yeah, so I mean, if, if you can't, if an IV is difficult, I mean, the, and, and you need to have an IV, it's an IO. Right, because the problem with good. giving anything IM or sub-Q is because there's so much volume of fluid that the rate of absorption is, is there's no way for us to control that. And so that's why she was saying IV is the best route or IO. The other thing really quickly too is patients who have up to a 40% burn, we can orally resuscitate those patients as well. So if we have a shortage of IV supplies or IV medications, that patient population certainly could benefit um, from oral resuscitation because most of the time patients outside of concomitant severe trauma, burn patients are awake and alert uh, initially. So I think that's something else for us to consider. And it's something else that it's something that I've also added to the revised uh, uh, state plan. So that would be a resource that I'll send out. Yeah, that's important to mention. Okay, well, I don't see any other questions. So thank you both for your time today. We'll get the slides, a copy of the recording. And then uh, these resources from Judy posted onto our website. If you have any questions, you can always reach out to us at r7dhre at unmc.edu. And thank you everyone for attending today. Thanks, Dr. Wibbenmeyer, and thank you, Judy. Thank Thanks you. so much.